chasseur qui est parti en forêt pour, pour faire la chasse et le premier gibier qu'il a rencontré c'était un porc épique qui était en train de brouter une racine donc le chasseur qui s'appelle euh, Dibenga est arrivé et il a pris sa lance et ça a transpercé le porc épique et en plus ça, ça a aussi euh, transpercé la racine Quand il a commencé à manger, ben, il s'est rendu compte qu'elle avait un goût vraiment amer et qui n'était qui qui était pas peut-être normal pour une viande normale. À partir du moment où il a consommé cette plante, il a commencé à avoir les visions et c'est à partir de ce moment-là qu'il a compris qu'il y avait quelque chose, il y avait un rapport entre les deux qui, qui ont fait qu'il découvre en fait cette plante. My little girl's name is Lexi, and my two boys are Monty, who's after my father, who passed away, and um, the other one is Sai, after my name, Sai. And they're great, totally inspirations for me. But uh, my heroin use, I was able to hide it from everybody. I mean, I was pretty active, heroin addict. I didn't, hadn't lost my job. I hadn't lost my family yet, but I, I was about ready to. And I knew I, I just wanted to stop. I have to use daily to just to get up out of bed. And I would um, do maybe close to a gram a day. And then I would always mix it with speed so that the heroin and the speed would kind of keep me balanced. But it's no life to live. 
Every morning you wake up and you're so sick. Till you get your first fix. And nothing stops you from that first fix. Not your kids. Not nothing. I was having breakfast with a friend of mine who was a chemist and he was going through a freezer he had and the freezer was full of different types of drugs. He pulled out a small vial and said, I think you'll be interested in this. I said, well, what is it? He said, well, it's an African hallucinogen and it lasts 36 hours. So uh, here I am under the influence of this very powerful hallucinogen. And um, I get home and uh, I, I lay down and um, the ibogaine is working and working and working and working. And uh, it's 33 hours later and... I only thought to myself, I'm exhausted, I'm going to sleep for a week, and I'm never going to take this drug again. And I got dressed, and I walked out of the house, and that's when I, I realized that I was not in narcotic withdrawal. And I looked at this large tree in front of me, and I looked at the clouds in the sky, and I realized that for the first time in my life, I was not frightened, and perceived that my entire life had been full, full of fear. Uh, somewhere, I think it was the end of 1988 or early 89, I believe, I received a call from Mr. Howard Lotsoff, uh, who was uh, living in Staten Island in New York City, uh, and he claimed he had a, a cure for drug addiction. And he explained that uh, somewhere in the late 60s, he took this bizarre drug called the Ibogaine, uh, and uh, after that experience, he had lost his cravings for drugs, and prior to that time, he had been a multi-drug user. At the time I received this call, uh, I really didn't think very much of it. And I get numerous calls from people who claim they have a cure for something or, or other and they want me to study it. Uh, and most of these people, I think, are really not in touch with reality. And I assume Mr. Lotsoff was of uh, a similar nature, and I dismissed uh, the call, really. Uh, he uh, called back several times, and the more I talked to him, uh, the more intrigued I became. And I was particularly intrigued by the fact that he claimed that you took this drug once and you lost your cravings for drugs uh, at least for several months or forever. Uh, and this so, sort of magic bullet notion uh, is really unlike uh, any pharmaceutical we have really for any disease. Good evening, I'm Forrest Sawyer and this is day one. What if we could cure drug addiction with a single pill? I'm clean. I have no, I don't have any cravings for cocaine. But the cure itself makes you high. And government researchers wonder if it really cures anything at all. Ibogaine is a psychedelic drug that puts its users on a three-day trip. It's illegal in the U.S. and no one knows if it really works. It took me from 1984 to 1991 through the leadership of three different directors of the National Institute on Drug Abuse to finally get them to take a serious look at Ibogaine. Now, imagine that you are a doctor. You spend 12 years getting your education. You spend 15 years in the field becoming an expert. And then uh, the last thing you're going to want to hear is some former heroin addict went and discovered the, the effective medication that you're looking for. So there was enormous resistance. The Drug Enforcement Agency says Ibogaine has a high potential for abuse and no accepted medical use in treatment. Moi, je suis euh, guérisseur euh, traditionnel euh, du Gabon. Dans ma famille, mon grand-père est initié. Euh, moi, j'ai été initié à l'âge de 7 ans dans, dans ma famille. Et donc, euh, j'ai grandi dans cette tradition. Il m'a permis d'apprendre tout ce que je sais aujourd'hui. Ça, c'est la racine de l'iboga. Et euh, là, elle est dans son état brut. Donc, c'est un échantillon que j'ai déraciné pour toujours montrer aux gens à partir du moment où ils ont besoin de savoir à quoi ça ressemble l'iboga. Et donc, euh, nous, par exemple, dans, dans, dans l'iboga, on n'utilise pas tout ça. On n'utilise ni le bois, on n'utilise pas, euh, on n'utilise ni cette première peau. On râpe 
les, la première écorce de la racine n'est pas mangeable. Donc, on ne la consomme pas, la première écorce. Mais c'est la deuxième écorce. Donc, à partir du moment où tu vas râper la deuxième écorce, tu verras ap apparaître un, à peine le bois. Et donc, c'est cette deuxième écorce qui se consomme et qui a les vertus thérapeutiques pour l'initiation à l'Iboga. Originally, uh, the problem started, we went through an awful divorce um, that devastated the family. Um, it overnight changed our standard of living. And my daughter at that time um, was about 13, uh, or 13 when she started drinking wine, taking things out of the refrigerator, things like that. One, and it progressed very quickly to marijuana, um, anything she could, inhalants, pills. Pretty quickly it progressed till I was doing crack and heroin when I was around 16. And um, once I was addicted to drugs, I couldn't work or go to school. I knew that it was so bad that it was going to kill me, but I, I just couldn't, I couldn't stop. The, like the first chance I would get five dollars in my hand, it was like this uncontrollable response. Um, but I did, I did come to a place where. It, It was really clear that I had to find a way to, to get sober, or I was just going to die really soon. Yeah, miniature miniature I never could accept the, um, the philosophy of tough love. I, I just couldn't. Everyone around me said the only way that you can help is by stepping back and not no form of support. But um, her drug use had gotten so severe Uh, that uh, I, I couldn't step back and just wait for the worst to happen. So I uh, started learning about how to help. Um, I sent her to uh, a number of treatment centers, one in California, one in Dayton, one in Cleveland, all over, and all very expensive, um, thinking the better the, the care, the better it would it help. Um, uh, nothing, nothing would last. She would Uh, go through it. She got so knowledgeable she could teach the courses. She knew it here. But uh, she said, uh, you know, in, in discussing her relapses, she'd say, I just, I just can't help it. Um, on a number of occasions, um, not a number, uh, two occasions, it was so severe that she had lost a pulse. She had turned blue. She needed to be resuscitated with the uh, cardio, whatever you call those elect electro things, um, to bring her to bring to start her heart again. So um, it just got to the point. The only word I can use for it is desperate. So I went on the internet. Read everything I could get uh, on this, and I talked to my daughter about uh, about this, and um, it was to the point where I put everything in balance, and it was either my daughter was going to die, excuse me, um, excuse me. Um, or to do something um, as unconventional and uh, radical. It, I am a, I'm a middle-class American guy. I, I was, I'm not prone to doing things outside of the, uh, you know, uh, certainly not outside of the law. I began, I found out very quickly, is not legal in this country. Yeah, I began as a Schedule One substance within the United States. It was dumped into Schedule One because it has properties similar to a hallucinogen. So, you know, during the whole drug hysteria with LSD and everything else, I was like, okay, ban that too. Of course, the irony is the definition of a Schedule One substance is a substance that has absolutely no medicinal value. 
Now, I would say that something that lets you completely step out of, you know, heroin addiction or move away from crack or an entire variety of uh, polysubstance abuse disorders has a whole hell of a lot of medicinal value. What we're gonna do is we're gonna give you the Ibogaine. Okay. First, we're gonna give you a test dose with a medication for nausea. Okay. Half an hour later, we're gonna give you the rest of the dose. Mm -hmm. The total weight, the total dose is determined by your body weight. Okay. The reason we split it up see if you have an allergic reaction and also to make the experience smoother. Okay. Okay. It is very important that as soon as you start feeling it, you don't move because it causes intense nausea when you move your hand. Oh, wow. So don't move your hand. You know, whatever you do, just lie down and don't oh, move Because I do hand. get car sick and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Well, everybody gets nauseous with either game oh. if they move. Okay, I'll be careful. Just don't move your hand. Okay. Ibogaine administration needs to be done in a safe situation. Um, Ibogaine is not inherently safe, as people have found out uh, time and time again. And for us, the two most important things is the safety and the comfort of the patient. Everything, everything else pales in comparison. So we try to administer our Ibogaine in a safe situation. We use a hospital. We put our patients on heart monitors. We have nurses and people available with emergency plans. And the next thing is the patient's comfort. I mean, that's why we're here, is to make these patients comfortable. If they wanted a detox that was hard, they could go and do cold turkey. But we want to take what could be an uncomfortable situation and make it as comfortable as possible for them. It's right here. It unplugs. Uh, all right, so if you need to use the bathroom, I'll assist you in plugging it back in, but if you need to go ahead, and just you can just snap it off, okay? Okay, cool. Thank you. Now, did the doctor explain to you that if you see anything that is disturbing or that you don't like, you can blink your eyes, it'll go away? Okay. Very good. I'm going to leave you alone for about a half an hour and then I'll come back and check on you. All right, cool. All righty. Thank you. My father was an extremely powerful man. And he, I don't know, always to look up to him and always to just being a kid. And then he ended up passing away while I was like 19. So it's just really difficult for me. So then I, I ended up going up to San Francisco and um, got into heroin up there. Found, found that missing piece. But then that missing piece is the devil. Oh, 
Le guérisseur qui travaille avec un patient doit d'abord le lire. À partir du moment où il lit le patient, il sait que telle personne a un problème là, 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 là. Et donc, quand il va travailler avec lui, bon, il sait que je dois travailler avec lui comme ça, comme ça, comme ça, parce que quelque part, lui, il a tel et tel problème, euh, donc euh, il faudrait que ça s'adapte comme ça pour lui. Et c'est pour ça que euh, le travail de l'Iboga est bien ciblé et bien cadré, selon les personnes, comme je disais tout à l'heure. C'est-à-dire que chaque personne a un traitement bien défini pour soi. Pendant l'initiation, on te prend un miroir, on te le pose devant toi, on te maquille. À partir de ce moment-là, tu regardes dans le miroir. Donc à partir de là, tu vas commencer à percevoir ta double personnalité. Donc tu, tu rentres dans le miroir, tu te traverses, puisque tu as toi en face de toi. Tu pénètres à l'intérieur de toi-même pour voir exactement qui tu es à l'intérieur de toi-même. Ce n'est pas un travail d'hallucination, ou c'est... Non, c'est vraiment un travail visionnaire. Ce n'est pas des hallucinations. C'est vraiment du concret, du tic au tac. Ré... Question, réponse. What exactly does it do? We don't know. But of course, that same answer can be applied to many things that are in the PDR right now. We don't know, but they seem to work. Ibogaine has affinity for multiple receptor sites. Classically, uh, in the past, the FDA does not like that. They like specific mechanisms of action that can have a direct cause and effect. So, I mean, if you want to hit addiction, you do have to hit it at multiple levels. And in addition to, like, pharmacological agents, you, you do need some sort of psychological paradigm to navigate whatever it is that you do to tune your head you have to do something so the exact mechanism of action i mean there are a lot of theories but the bottom line is nobody is exactly sure everything that it's doing i mean it seems to hit a neuroreceptor reset it um It blocks opiate withdrawal cravings. I mean, having been there and done that, oh, fuck yeah, it does. <laughs> it, it works. Nothing else does. You're not going through withdrawal. Ah, uh, fine. Very good. Very good. Okay. Are you uncomfortable? No, I just had to side, lay on my side. My back was starting to hurt a little bit. I, is that okay? Oh, man, it's perfectly okay. You know, you have a bucket here in case you have any nausea? Okay, cool. Thank yeah. you very much. And I'm going to give you some more time. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh -huh. There's like this feeling of warmth in your solar plexus, like this ball of heat. And the warmth slowly feels like it's kind of coiling up your spine. And as it's moving up your spine, the pain lets go. It's like this vice that is smashing it, is releasing. And it keeps going. And you're going from a state where you're just experiencing complete hell. And it feels like you're being suspended in this warm field of energy. That's pretty fucking amazing, because within 30 to 45 minutes of doing Ibogaine, your habit is gone. Although you don't have a lot of time to reflect on it right at that moment, because that's when uh, sort of the visionary part starts.
for a long time. I don't know why. Yeah, I'm just so fixed up right now. I can't tell you. Oh, shit. That's difficult to tell. Yeah, because it's very intense. It's like, uh... I don't know, it's like... I don't know what it's like. It's like Freud. I've been, I've remembered memories from my childhood, and I swear I, I saw things that, uh, I don't know, it was like so trippy. It felt like I was flying, it was so cool. first look at it in terms of its treatment of chemical dependence. What is so special about Ibogaine is it can reverse addiction. I mean, we can take an active heroin addict, an active cocaine addict, somebody with a completely runaway addiction syndrome, and bring them into a hospital, if, if we were doing it, or into an apartment, or into a Bweedy Chapel, and give them Ibogaine, or Iboga, or Iboga extracts and completely reverse that addiction syndrome, literally turning an addict into a non-addict over a two to three day period. And that's simply unseen. Uh, in terms of its other known value as a psychotherapeutic drug, as a drug to be used in psychotherapy, I don't think that it has an equal. I think ibogaine is the most dramatic drug to, that can be used in psychotherapy. It just allows a complete review by the individual of the issues they consider most important to themselves. We all know the questions we have to ask, and we all know the answers, and Ibogaine precipitates that discussion. Good morning, how are you doing? Good. Good. Okay. So what do you feel right now? <clears throat> resting for a little bit and then getting up. Uh, but you have runny nose, runny eyes, <clears throat> yawning, no? Diarrhea, nothing. 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 It's like, mm -hmm. I feel like I'm totally drug free. Yeah. It's so trippy. But I'm pretty worked. It's, yeah, you're fatigued. That's normal. All right, I'll see you probably tomorrow. Right? Thank you, doctor. All right. Cure is a very strange word. Cure implies that 
something outside of yourself will completely rewire you. It will not. You are still whoever you are. But people are different. The question is, what are you other than drug dependent? And, uh, you know, different people have different pathways out of that. But the bottom line is you have to face yourself. You have to deal with yourself. And it's really very hard sometimes. What Ibogaine is, Ibogaine is this doorway that you walk through. And on the other side, you're clean. But the problem is when you get to the other side of the doorway, there's a vacuum behind you. And that vacuum is trying to suck you back into addiction. So if you don't get up and get moving away from that doorway, you're going to get sucked back into your addiction. People need to know that Ibogaine is not a magic bullet. It's not a cure for addiction. It's an addiction interrupter. And it will give many people a chance they would not have without it. I like to say that Ibogaine is a catalyst for change. If you come here determined to use the Ibogaine, determined to stay clean, I think you'll stay clean. If you come take Ibogaine for kicks, you know, you're probably going to go back to using afterwards. So if you're going to choose to do Ibogaine, come with a plan. Plan to go into some kind of aftercare home. Plan to move. Plan to break up with that boyfriend that you're using dope with. Um, the first people that I met when I settled here, I guess there was still something in me that was attracting the sort of people that, that I didn't need to be hanging around with and I I thought that it would be okay for me to just smoke pot and drink and have a normal life because I hadn't had a normal childhood and I wanted to do it but it quickly led to me finding crack. I never was able to find heroin in this town which is really good. <laughs> um, and the, the problem that I had here was very short compared to my life before but it it took me getting to a place where I realized it wasn't something that was out of my control or out of my hands. I had to make a conscious choice whether I wanted to live or die, and nobody was going to do it for me. And Ibogaine could, could certainly help with the cravings, but it, it wasn't going to be the catalyst for that willingness. Here is the things you need to get. At a health food store, you need to get melatonin and vitamin B. The melatonin will help you sleep. You take one for 10 days before sleeping, okay? Yeah. Stay away from people who are not good for you, places, situations. I mean, you know what triggers you to relapse. So uh, take it slowly, you know? And then time, take it slowly, eat well, and uh, exercise. And you'll see, you'll start feeling much better. I mean, today is just, you know, the emotional aspects are coming out. Every day you'll feel stronger, okay? Your energy will come back, your mood will improve, you'll feel much better, okay? If there's anything we can do for you, just give us a call. Okay, well, all right? Thanks. You're welcome. Thanks, Brian. You're welcome. I'm 34 years old now. I don't know if that matters, you know? Maybe if I was 23, I wouldn't stop. Maybe I wasn't ready. But at 30 fucking four, I'm done. It doesn't mean that I won't go to concerts. It doesn't mean that I won't go out dancing. It doesn't mean why I won't live my life. But I'm just not gonna be on drugs. My passions are surfing. My passions are snowboarding. My children. Who needs heroin? Okay. <laughs> 
I think that ibogaine is a very important treatment option that needs to be made more available to, to everybody. And it's not available right now. There's only a very few places to go do it, and there's only a very few places to do it safely. And it's unfair that the drug addicts that are, you know that can't afford to come down to Mexico, that can't afford to fly up to Vancouver or get into their program because it's hard to get into their program, and can't afford to go to St. Kitts or can't afford to fly over to Amsterdam, can't have this treatment. It's not fair to them. And that, this is when ibogaine becomes political because the FDA, I don't think, is going to approve this. There's no pharmaceutical company that's going to administer this. The only way we're going to make ibogaine legal here in the United States is if we end the drug war. When we end the drug war, then we can say, okay, ibogaine is available to the people that need it. And then we can give it to the different drug treatment centers that would be able to handle situations and, and administer this safely. The patents on using ibogaine for uh, drug dependence and various polysubstance abuse disorders, I mean, the opiate patent has expired as of 2004. Um, the rest of them are in the process of expiring. So you can't patent it for, as an as a addiction interrupter, as it's been called. It is not a maintenance drug. It, you know, you take something once, twice, three times. If you've taken Ibogaine more than three times and you're still, like, strung out, it, it's all you. So it's, it's not something that anyone's going to generate a lot of money on because no one keeps taking it. There's no maintenance. It has that really annoying side effect of producing those waking visions. It is potentially dangerous if given to the wrong people in the wrong dose ranges. Basically, everything you can possibly stack against something, it's stacked against Ibogaine. I've been to the Betty Ford Center. Really? I ended up shooting up on my way out of the parking lot. I went to McDonald's Center in San Diego. Went to Vista Pacifica. I've been to Charter. God, you've been to more than I have. Dude, I've had a hellacious time getting off this shit. So, when did you first start trying to get clean and stuff? Maybe eight, nine years ago. Yeah. It's about the same. I was about 11 years from me in 92. I was looking for something to fill a void in my soul. I feel like I'm not missing that piece anymore. Like whatever happened filled all my voids. I don't know why. It's like beyond me. It's like, I, I can't grasp it. Uh, you have to understand the pharmaceutical industry. The pharmaceutical industry is not there to develop medications to cure disease. It's there to develop medications to increase the profits of shareholders. Now, as a president of a small pharmaceutical <clears throat> or medical development corporation, I contacted the licensing directors of major companies like Lilly and DuPont and uh, Sibagaygi, medium uh, companies, and even smaller companies trying to obtain their interest. And the, the, the similarity of response was really surprising from larger companies to medium companies to small companies. The reason of lack of interest, not only in ibogaine, but in medications to treat addiction were all the same. The first issue was the fatality rate in the population of drug users. Drug users are dying at a rate of three to seven times the normal population, which means that the liability to the company associated with those fatalities is that much greater. So immediately, there is a deficit of liability to the development of drugs to treat that disorder. Also, I was reminded that the companies have to spend their money in the best way to demonstrate profits to their shareholders, not in the best way to treat various diseases. Additionally, 
the companies did not wish to get involved with the treatment of drug addiction because of the stigma associated with the field. And you would think that, well, if a company developed a cure for addiction, that would be very good for them. But the stigma attached to addiction is so great that even to provide effective medications in that field is viewed as problematical by the companies. It certainly should be an um, uh, angry, yeah, that, uh, disappointed more than anything, but not surprised, frankly. Uh, I think there's enough wheels within wheels and machinations uh, that I can kind of understand why it's not in their best interest to come, come up with it. But God willing, a good capitalist at, at one of those drug companies will say, oh, this could be a gold mine, and they'll go and do it, and then, and then it will be available legally uh, through however it be dispensed. But uh, that didn't stop me from, from leaving the country. Um, uh, that's how desperate I was. And unfortunately, there are a lot of people that, that have the resources I did at the time, uh, which are modest, but um, you know, uh, think of all the people on the street that could benefit from this, and they don't have the wherewithal to do it, and all the other things that go with recovery. Nino <laughs> Girl. Can I have a kiss? You get your sloppy face? Love you. Yeah, I'm home. This is home. This is my little girl, Lexi. My dog. That's my boy, Monty. No, no, no. I know. It's just soft. That's it. There's a lot more to the story than people are learning in treatment centers and at 12-step meetings. And there's nothing wrong with either of those institutions, but their message is that drug addicts have a disease, they're going to have it the rest of their life. Um, and there's, this, there's only one approach to healing that disease, which is to go to meetings and um, do the 12 steps. And, and I certainly think those things are helpful, but they never get you past the place where you're identified as being a person with a sickness that sort of always has to be a consideration in your life. And I feel like Ibogaine has introduced me to this whole parallel universe of realizing that my mind is not all there is. And while my drug problem was very real, um, it doesn't have to ever happen again. And that's because I can choose for it to not happen again. Uh, global awareness and availability has significantly expanded and increased. I think that is absolutely wonderful and I think that will continue. At the same time, I have great doubts that it's ever going to be an accepted treatment modality for drug dependence. I see a few very small, sort of aborted efforts that, that haven't gone anywhere. Unfortunately, I think I began will simply continue to exist, expand, and grow. 
and the awareness of it grows. So people who are in a position that they need it at least know that it's out there. And if you know that it's out there, then you have the opportunity to make choices and get it, however it is that you do so. Unfortunately, I do not think you're going to be in a position in Western society anywhere that you're going to go to your doctor and, okay, I'm strung out, and he's going to say, oh, okay, well, you can get Ibogaine treatment. I, I would want that. That would be the right thing to do. I, unequivocally, I can say that would be the right thing to do. But it's, I don't see it happening. I really don't. I don't believe that Ibogaine will be the drug that's used in the future. I think it will be used. But I, like a lot of other people, are waiting to see what the second generation drugs will turn out to be. When you're an addict and suddenly are not an addict, that's a very valuable experience. And I observed how poorly treated addicts are in our society. And I wanted to do something with my life, and the most important thing that I could perceive of doing was producing Ibogaine as an available medically approved drug. And that's what I, what drove me.